Now I have my syllabus in uh, the chapter, The Tale of the Three Brothers. Is that where we left off? Anybody confirm? Pardon? Okay. Yeah, me. My syllabus got misplaced. Um, fairly early on in the chapter, correct? Right after. Okay. <clears throat> That's right. We were discussing Nurmengard, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> you get to the end of that section. And Harry and Ron, Harry and Ron, Harry and Hermione are talking about Dumbledore and Grindelwald and Nurmengard and stuff. And Harry yells at Hermione, the Dumbledore we thought we knew didn't want to conquer muggles by force. And Hermione says, he changed, Harry. He changed. It's as simple as that. I think that's page 362. Maybe he did believe those things when he, these things when he was 17, but the whole of the rest of his life was devoted to fighting the dark arts. Dumbledore was the one who stopped Grindelwald, the one who always voted for muggle protection, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Why is this important? Notice how old Dumbledore was when he wrote the letter to Grindelwald. He's the exact same age Harry, Ron, and Hermione are now. Okay. And what kind of ideas did he espouse then? Magic is might. I mean, he hook line and sinker. He was a true believer. Not, not in the Voldemortian sense. He thought magic gave them what? Not only power, but what goes with that? Cue the Uncle Ben, you know, Spider-Man line. With great power comes great responsibility. He thought, you know, they have this power to do good. Same kind of thing Gandalf talks about in, you know, the Lord of the Rings. What's the, what's the desire of the ring? To do good. Though in that context, the ring can never produce any good. Okay. So, Hermione says, he changed, Harry. Go back for a second to the second book. We hear Hagrid early on talk about the Malfoys and say, rotten to the core, bad blood. But then later on, he explains what about himself in Dumbledore? He gives second chances. Why did he give second chances? Because he got a second chance. Okay. He's the one who always fought you know who from the start who died trying to bring him down. What does Dumbledore tell Harry at the end of book one? You know, in his debrief. It is our choices, Harry, that show who we truly are. Far more than our abilities. Right? What does Voldemort think is most important? Abilities. Not choices. Abilities. What does Dumbledore tell Fudge at the end of book four? Here's the last of a long line of pure blood wizards. Okay? Barney Crouch Jr. You know, and you've always put all your faith in pure blood. He says, and what did he do? It's the choices he made. He chose poorly, all right? Hermione, Harry, I'm sorry, but I think the real reason you're so angry is that Dumbledore never told you any of this himself. Maybe I am, Harry says. Look what he asked for me, Hermione. Risk your life, Harry, and again, and again. 
other than once Harry hears about the prophecy. In the book five. When did Dumbledore ever ask Harry to risk his life? Does he get a secret message in book one? Harry, the Philosopher's Stone, it's stuck in the mirror. Save it. Does he hear about, you know, here's how you open the Chamber of Secrets? No. Does he hear, you know, Sirius Black isn't really evil. He's your godfather. You must save him. No. Never. Okay. Don't expect me to explain everything. Just trust me blindly. Is it blind trust? Or is it based upon something? Is it based upon, you know, as Hermione says, and as others have said, his experiences with Dumbledore. His voice cracked with the strain and they stood looking at each other in the whiteness and the emptiness and Harry felt they were as insignificant as insects beneath that wide sky. Notice, looking at each other in the whiteness and the emptiness. That chapter began with Harry sitting at the entrance to the tent, looking out over the mountainsides, covered with snow. The sky is white like it gets sometimes in the dead of winter, almost like it's reflecting the snow down beneath. And the narrator tells us this should be the greatest joy in the world. It's Christmas morning. There's a little town down below, right? Because they're outside Godric's Hollow at this point. And, you know, it's Christmas morning. There's people down there. You can probably hear Christmas carols. I mean, it's almost like how the Grinch stole Christmas when the Grinch is up on Mount Crumpet and he looks down to Whoville and he hears the singing. He's like, what the hell? Right? But Harry, we're told here, he and Hermione are kind of surrounded by this whiteness. Why? The whiteness is important. It's foreshadowing. For a much later chapter, where Harry's going to wake up. And he's going to be surrounded, literally surrounded by whiteness. Okay? Hermione, he loved you. I know he loved you. I don't know who he loved, Hermione. What is Harry experiencing at that moment? Okay. He felt they were as insignificant as insects beneath that wide sky. What, what's Harry think about his whole existence? It's nothing. Absolutely nothing. I am meaningless. This is Harry reaching rock bottom. Remember earlier, hopelessness, we're told, had threatened to engulf, <clears throat> engulf him before they went to Godric's Hollow. And then they go to Godric's Hollow, and everything happens at Matilda Bagshots. It doesn't engulf him then. This is when it engulfs him. Why? What has happened to Dumbledore and Harry's mind? Let me rephrase that. What has happened to the Dumbledore Harry created in his mind? Remember we were told earlier he had idolized him? The idols come crashing down. The idol wasn't real. Harry's got to learn, understand the real Dumbledore. Okay? So, the Silver Dove. We've seen Harry's crash, and now what happens? We see Harry's rise. See, overall, you could read, I don't think I've ever done this in this class before, you could read the Harry Potter novels as a vast comedy. Not comedy in the sense of a half-hour sitcom, but comedy in the sense of, like, Dante's Divine comedy. And what it's referring to there is the overall <clears throat> the overall structure. See, in literature, you kind of have two different structures. 
for how a novel, how a play works. Okay? In a tragedy, you start off here, and then you get what's called the rising action and the complication, and up here you reach the climax. And this is also in, there's a big turn. Things turn for the worse. And then you have the falling action, the denouement, and the conclusion. Okay? Usually, in here, in here, lots of people die. And it ends on a note of sadness. But part of the reason for the sadness is the tragic hero gets tested and tried. We see to what extent that individual can suffer. And it's the suffering that makes or reveals the individual's humanity. What did Dumbledore tell Harry at the end of book five? It is this pain that shows you are still human. And Harry says, if that's what makes me human, I don't want it. Okay? In a comedy, okay, you also start with a point of conflict. Right? But in that point of conflict, in this, you know, so you got this point of conflict in both of them. And what the conflict does is it tears society, creates a rupture in society. In tragedy, the only way the society is repaired is the tragic hero dies. Okay? In comedy, the tragic hero doesn't die because it's not a tragic hero. In comedy, you get the rupture, okay? This still represents kind of this rising action, the complication, but it's called a falling action. Because at this point in a comedy, it could turn into a tragedy. At the climax, the play could become a tragedy, but it doesn't. Instead, what happens as a result of the climax in a comedy is society starts to be restored. The rupture is closed. The tearing is mended. Usually, in this comedy form, that rupture is within a family. Shakespeare, for example, it's usually between fathers and daughters. Daughter wants to get married. Father doesn't want the daughter to marry this person. Father has somebody else in mind. Midsummer Night's Dream is the comedy form of Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet, two lovers. Parents don't want them to get married. Midsummer Night's Dream, two lovers. Her father wants her, Hermia, to marry another man. She doesn't want to marry that man. And it gets to this point, and it could become a tragedy. But instead, the lovers are joined at the end. There's supernatural influence, all that kind of stuff. We're at kind of this point in the Harry Potter novel. Right? At the end of the life and times of life and lives of Alice Dumbledore. Why do we start to see, or when do we start to see the rise? Why isn't it just, you know, why isn't it this one, but this one? Because of the chapter of the Silver Dove. Because what happens? What does Harry find? Sword of Gryffindor. Sword of Gryffindor. How does he find it? Notice, he's sitting in the tent, and we're told, after two nights of little sleep, Harry's senses seem more alert than usual. In other words, he's on the third day. Kind of like two nights after, I think it's implied, two nights after Christmas. So it's the third day after that. So third day automatically should bring up what? How many days did he spend in the infirmary at the end of the first book? Right. What did he have to do in that first book before he went into the infirmary? How did he get the philosopher's stuff? How did it begin? 
We'd have to go through. Trap door. He had to descend, die. Infirmary for three days, and he wakes up again. What's the first thing he sees when he wakes up? Gold twinkling. It's like death, rebirth. Okay. This, however, notice it's not morning, it's nighttime. So it's she kind of reverses that, but it's still the third day. Okay. His senses are all alert. And what does he see? He sees something out in the woods, and he follows that light. Okay. A silver doe that he follows. Something tells him it's not dark magic, so follow it. Okay. And what does it lead him to? It leads him to a pool of water. Okay. The pool of water has frozen over, but it's frozen over in such a way that it's been cracked. That is, the crack isn't natural. If, if you go off in the woods when it's really, really, really cold and you find pools of water, that, you know, the ice is smooth as glass. Something has cracked this for a reason, okay? And what does he do? He holds up Hermione's wand because his wand is gone. That's why he reached bottom. That in the life and lives of Albus Dumbledore. And notice, he moved forwards ca rather cautiously and looked down. The ice reflected his distorted shadow, distorted because it's broken, in the beam of one light. But deep below the thick, misty gray carapace, something else glinted a great silver cross. Notice specific language a cross. And then what does he see? A glint of deep red. So it's the third day. There's a cross in deep red. Blood? Yeah, that's what it's meant to symbolize. What's the deep red from? I mean, we do know this is the sword of God and Christian, right? We're told in book two, the sword has rubies the size of eggs on the hilt. So that's what he sees. So at first, it just looks like a cross. Then he sees the deep red, dot, dot, dot. Notice what's happening. Here he's looking, and at first, it's the shape of a cross. He sees red, and then his mind is making sense of what he's seeing. At first, it's just sensory perception. It's a sword, the sword of God of Griffin. Right? Now, where have we already heard about the Sword of God or Gryffindor? They're listening to the radio, right? Or overhearing the conversation. And they hear Jenny, Luna, Neville trying to break into Snape's office to steal the Sword of God or Gryffindor. But it, they got caught. Okay? So, here he sees it. He knows that can be used to destroy the locket. And he's like, help, somebody help. How am I going to get this out? So he breaks the ice. Why? Because what does he realize he has to do? We hear Harry say, defendo, a couple pages later. The ice cracks. As far as Harry could judge, it was not deep, but to retrieve the sword, he would have to submerge himself completely. Why? Baptism. He's got to go all the way under to reach that sword and come back up. But what happens when he goes under? He's still got the horcrux around his neck. And he goes under to reach the horcrux. And notice, the horcrux is like what compared to the sword? Or the horcrux is like what compared to the cross? Yeah, it's the opposite. You know, the cross metaphorically gives life. I mean, didn't for Christ, but for those who follow Christ, metaphorically it does. The Horcrux takes away life because of the soul, you know, Voldemort and such. 
So he goes in, and the horcrux starts choking him. He can't get up. Who rescues him? Ron, what language is used to describe his rescuer? Notice, it's not his rescuer. Harry had no strength to lift his head and see his blank's identity, his saviors. Okay. Now, I don't know that Rowling is aware of this tradition or not, but in the Eastern Orthodox Church, like the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all that kind of stuff, on what's called the Feast of Theophany, which is on January 6th, which celebrates the circumcision of Christ, uh, baptism of Christ, sorry, celebrates the baptism of Christ, um, there's a ritual that occurs. And, you know, it's, it's really cool if you live somewhere where it's warm, like Florida or Greece or, you know, South America or the equator. And what happens is there's a, a divine liturgy is performed and there's blessing of waters. And then the priest will take a cross and throw it out in the water. And the young men will all jump in and see who can be first to get it kind of a thing. All right. Really sucks, however, if you live in Russia or Finland or Sweden or Norway where they have to break the ice so that the thing can be thrown in, and then you jump in, okay? Very similar to what's happening here. So, Ron saves Harry. How did Ron get back? How did Ron know where to find them? The Deluminator. So, what do we see? We see, hey, Dumbledore kind of knew what he was doing when he gave Ron that gift as part of his will. It's implied Dumbledore knew what he was doing when he gave Hermione that book, right? Because Hermione has started to ask and wonder about this thing, which they saw on the tombstone, you know, in Godric's Hollow. It's in the book. They saw it on... Xenophilius' robes. So, they used the sword to destroy the Horcrux. Next chapter. And we're going to go kind of quickly from here on out. Xenophilius Lovegood. Let's see. This is 17 pages forward. Hermione says, I want to talk to Xenophilus Lovegood because she wants to talk to him about the symbol. Okay? So they go to his house. Skip chapter 20, in fact. Just go to 21. And he brings, he asks about the Deathly Hallows. Or Hermione does. And he says, that's right. Lovegood does. That's right. You haven't heard of them? I'm not surprised. Very, very few wizards believe. Witness that knuckleheaded young man at your brother's wedding, he nods at Ron, who attacked me for sporting the symbol of a well-known dark wizard. Who's the knuckleheaded young man he's talking about? Victor Crumb. Okay. He says one uses the symbol to reveal oneself to other believers, much like, sorry, it's not a good one, Christians used the image of the fish in the first couple centuries after Christ. Go to Roman catacombs. You see this above um, burial niches. Okay? Christians would have it tattooed as a sign to use to indicate, you know, I'm a believer too. So, he goes on and says, believers seek the deathly hallows. So, they talk about the story. What is the story? Real briefly. She steals the story basically from Geoffrey Chaucer. It's the partner's tale. Okay? About people who seek death in Chaucer's version. All right? So, we're not going to talk about the story. What's the triangle represent? 
Cloak. What's the circle? Stone. Line is the wand. Okay. Why are these called hallows? What is something that is hallowed? All Hallows Eve, Halloween. All Hallows Day. All Hallows Eve, Halloween, is the night before All Hallows Day. What's the other word that's used for Hallows? All Saints Day. Hallows are things that are holy or sanctified or pure in some sense. Okay? So, to hear the story, and you get to the end of the recounting of the story, and Xenophilia says, well, there you are, and Hermione's like, what do you mean? Those are the Deathly Hallows. And he draws the Deathly Hallows out. The Elder Wand, the Resurrection Stone, the Cloak of Invisibility. Together, the Deathly Hallows. Hermione says, but there's no mention of the words Deathly Hallows. Well, of course not, he says. That is a children's tale. Told to amuse rather than to instruct. Notice, it's a children's tale. Told to amuse, not to teach. This is what he says. Those of us who understand these matters, however, recognize that the ancient story refers to three objects or hallows, which, if united, will make the possessor master of death. What does he mean by master of death? And, second part of that question, does he mean the same thing Dumbledore means? Later. Ron, uh, what do you mean, Master of Death? Hermione, you mean these things actually exist? Of course. Hermione, how can you possibly believe? And notice she doesn't get to finish her question. Luna has told me all about you. You are, I gather, not unintelligent, but painfully limited, narrow, closed-minded. How is... Hermione, limited, narrow, closed-minded. And what does she read? Primarily, what does she read? What kind of what kind of books? Yeah, nonfiction stuff about reality. It's got to be real. For Hermione, Hermione's kind of a what's called a logical positivist. That is, if it can't be proven, if it can't be quantified, if it can't be tested, it's not real. Even though she tells Harry at the end of the first book, you know, honor, loyalty, friendship, these things are all greater than what? Book learning. She says that. But she doesn't really believe it at that point, okay? So, she goes on and says, uh, he goes on and says, talking about the invisibility cloak. But the third hallow is a true cloak of invisibility, Miss Granger. I mean, it's not a traveling cloak imbued with a disillusionment charm or carrying a bedazzling hex or else woven from Dimmy Guy's hair, which will hide one initially, but fade with the years until it turns opaque. We are talking about a cloak that really and truly renders the wearer completely invisible and endures eternally, giving constant and impenetrable concealment, no matter what spells are cast at it. How many cloaks have you ever seen like that? Have we seen one like that? Think about it. Here it's where I think there might be a problem with her writing. Book two. Harry and Hermione? I think. Yes, 
Harry and Hermione are hiding in Hagrid's hut. They're under the invisibility cloak. Dumbledore and Fudge come in. And then Lucius Malfoy comes in. And what does Dumbledore do? Just before he's leave, before he leaves, he looks in the corner directly at them and says, no, I will only truly have left when no one here is loyal to me. And Harry had the distinct feeling that Dumbledore was looking right at him. Okay, so he doesn't throw a spell at it. But if it's a true cloak of invisibility, how come he can seemingly see through it? First book. Harry comes in wearing the cloak in the room where the mirror is. Dumbledore is sitting on the desk in the back of the room. And he says, you don't have to have a cloak of invisibility to make yourself invisible. And he also says, funny how being invisible makes you very nearsighted. Kind of implying you don't see anything out there. Okay. Moody can see through it with his magical eye. I think those are little, again, all little things from relatively early in the series. And then she writes this. And kind of has to go, hmm, i got to figure out a way to... And this is why, again, I'll say she needs to do a revision, okay? So, they keep talking, and Hermione says, how can that be real? Come on, how? Xenophilias, prove that it is not. Hermione, but that... <coughs> That's ridiculous. How can I possibly prove it, the invisibility cloak, or the resurrection stone, or the wand, don't exist? They're talking specifically about the resurrection stone. How can I prove it doesn't exist? You expect me to get hold of, of all the pebbles in the world and test them? I mean, you could claim that anything's real if the only basis for believing in it is that nobody's proved it doesn't exist. And what does xenophilia say? You could. I'm glad to see you're opening your mind a little. What does he mean? She's breaking out of this. She's admitting the possibility. To quote Hamlet, there, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. That there's more that... that then can just be seen, examined. You know, what's the proof? When Harry turns 11 years old and his big giant oaf bursts down the door and tells him he's a wizard, all of a sudden, there's a whole new world out there. Okay? So, they go on, they talk about the Deathly Hallows, they talk about the three Peveril brothers, Antioch, Cadmus, Ignotus, you know, I've mentioned before, Ignotus, Antioch, St. Ignatius of Antioch and such. I think, I kind of think it's related. Hermione says, when they talk about the story some more, page 414, it's just a morality tale. It's obvious which gift is best. Morality, that is, it is a tale designed to teach a moral. And she says, it's obvious which, which gift is best. And Harry, Ron, and Hermione each speak at the same moment and each say something different. So, is this a relativistic morality tale? Hey, it all depends on what you want and what makes you happy, etc. No. What it shows is each of them desire different things out of life. Hermione says the cloak. Ron says the wand. Harry says the stone. Why does Hermione say the cloak? Why does Hermione want to be invisible? Want to be able to conceal herself? Why does Ron want the wand? It's pretty obvious why Harry wants the stone. Everybody he loves is dead. Well, except for Hermione, Ron, Jenny, you know, Hagrid, Luna, etc. His family's all dead. It'd be kind of nice to be able to find a stone and you know be able to wave it and they come back. But why does Hermione want the 
Notice, I've heard about you. What does um, Neville's grandmother say on the closed ward? Neville's told me all about you. Everybody's heard about Hermione. Why? You ask a question in class, boom, the hand goes up. Is it that she would like some anonymity? I think that's kind of it. Why does Ron want the wand? What did he see when he looked in the mirror? Himself <laughs> and nobody else. Because he's tired of just being another Weasley brat, you know? He wants to stand out. He wants to shine. Why else? Because here's Harry and here's the sidekick. He never gets to be the motorcycle to the sidecar, you know? It's always motorcycle and Ron. So, they go on, they nearly get captured, and go on to chapter 22, The Deathly Hallows. Harry, Ron, and Hermione go off, they leave. Hermione says it's a bunch of nonsense, somewhere around 425. Ron says, hold on, Chamber of Secrets was supposed to be a myth too. That was real. Hermione, but they can't exist, Ron. Ron said, you keep saying that, but one of them we know does. Harry's. Thing is, who else had invisibility cloaks? Plural. Moody did. Okay. He loaned one to Sturgis Podmore, and he had his own with him still. Hermione, the tale of the three brothers is a story, a story about humans are frightened of death. If surviving was as simple as hiding under the invisibility cloak, we'd have everything we need already. Is it just about being frightened of death? Or is it about overcoming death? Or, put it another way, is it about overcoming the fear of death? Do you think Tom Marvolo Riddle ever read this story? He knows about the Elder Wand, but has he understood it if he even read it? Harry, when my wand connected with you-know-whos, it made my mom and dad appear and Cedric, Hermione, but they weren't really back, were they? Those kinds of pale imitations aren't the same as truly bringing someone back to life. True, but were they pale imitations? That's the question. What did James tell Harry after he came out of the wand? Hold the connection for a while. We'll get them distracted, and when I tell you, break the connection and get to the port key. He knows about the port key. He knows what's going on. He's talking in present tense, real time, live action, the whole nine yards. It's not a pale imitation. It's something else, but it's not that. Nor is it just an echo, as Dumbledore calls it. Okay, so they keep talking. Harry's starting to put things together, realizes the ring, you know, Marvolo gone, there, you know. Skip a bunch again. Uh, we're going to, I don't I have the page number marked. Uh, plus 80. Go to about four. Four thirty-two, four somewhere between probably four thirty-two, four thirty-five. Paragraph that begins um, in the wand, the elder wand. Where was that hidden? What page is that? Four thirty-four. Go 
Go down a few lines. Harry's thinking, where was Voldemort searching now? Harry wished his car would burn and show him Voldemort's thoughts. He and Voldemort were united and wanting the very same thing. Hermione would not like that idea, of course, but then she did not believe. Xenophilies had been right. Limited, narrow-minded, closed-minded. Narrow, closed-minded. Truth was that she was scared of the idea of the Deathly Hallows, especially of the Resurrection Stone. Why? Of all the rooms that they went into in the Department of Mysteries, which one did Hermione really want to get out of quickly? Which is what room? It's the death room. She's afraid of death. Why? Because you can't wrap your mind around it. It's not been described. It hasn't been quantified. That's why Dumbledore, it's partly why Dumbledore says, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. What's he mean by well-organized? It doesn't mean intellectual. It doesn't mean logical. It doesn't mean rational. It means the mind that puts everything kind of properly in its place and gives various things, various weights and such. Okay? But he says, if you think of that door as death, as the next great adventure, what does that imply? This is a great adventure. Okay? But it's not to be feared. Hermione fears it. She fears it, I think, just as much as Voldemort does. Because it's unknown. She likes things to be known. She likes the answers to all the questions. That's not one you can answer. Okay? He presses his mouth to the snitch again, kissing it, nearly swallowing it. He thinks about Luna, thinks they need to try to rescue her. They pack up the tent the next morning, skipping a couple paragraphs, and go down to the middle of that. He could think only of the Deathly Hallows. Notice what he's no longer thinking of. Horcruxes, Horcruxes, Horcruxes. It was as though a flame had been lit inside him. That nothing, not Hermione's flat misbelief, nor Ron's persistent doubts, could extinguish. Okay? That ardor, A-R-D-O-R, that he's had in a variety of the novels, that every time something really bad that he finds out about Dumbledore, you know, squashes it. Okay? That, that pilot light's lit now. Fiercer the longing for the hollows burned inside him, the less joyful it made him. Okay? And he goes on. He keeps thinking. And we're told at the end of one of the paragraphs, two or three down below that, why didn't Ron and Hermione understand? The last enemy that shall be, that shall be destroyed is death, Harry quoted. From Matthew and Luke. Hermione, I thought it was you know who we were supposed to be fighting. You know, she's kind of saying, we're arguing amongst ourselves. So, here he has a vision. The visions he and Voldemort were sharing, paragraph that begins, even the mystery of the silver dough, which the other two insisted on discussing, seemed less important. Middle of, uh, about a third of the way down. The visions he and Voldemort were sharing had changed in quality. They'd become blurred, shifting as though they were moving in and out of focus. Harry was just able to make out indistinct fe features of an object that looked like a skull and something like a mountain that was more shadow than substance. Why? Are we told anywhere in the rest of the novel what that image is of? Do they have to go to that place to find a Horcrux? No, they don't. Is it referred to anywhere? No, it's not. So, what does an image of a mountain 
that looks kind of like a skull have anything to do with the Deathly Hallows? Because that's what Eric's mind's focused on. How well do you know the biblical story of the Passion? Where Christ is crucified is called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And it's a mountain. There's nothing else. Okay, I don't know that that's what J.K. Rowling intends, but the very fact that he's focusing on these things, and one of them is a resurrection stone, and he's thinking of resurrection, and he's thinking of his parents, and he's thinking of death, and then he has these dreams, and in those dreams, he sees a mountain that looks kind of like a skull. Uh, it, it seems to me like the steps are too clear for it not to be that, okay? So, they overhear or listen to Potter Watch, and we hear, you know, Lee Jordan, we hear Kingsley Shacklebolt, um, we hear Lupin, okay? Kingsley says, page 440, muggles remain ignorant of the source of their suffering as they continue to suffer heavy casualties. Why? Because where is the real source of their suffering? It's not, the it's not in the physical world. It's the wizarding world or the unseen. There's a great battle going on, you know. And then he goes on and says, we're all human, aren't we? Every human life is worth the same and worth saving. Okay? The boy who lived, says Lupin, skipping several paragraphs, remains a symbol of everything for which we are fighting. Now, remember, when was the last time we saw Lupin? What did Harry say to him? Sum it up with one word. Coward. Okay. And Lupin you know, zaps him in the chest, kind of like Scrimger did, or gets close to at least. The boy you lived remains a symbol of everything for which we are fighting. Here's what that means. The triumph of good, the power of innocence, the need to keep resisting. And Harry's like, oh, let go. Makes him feel better. Okay? So, they get captured, taken off to Malfoy Manor, skipping a bunch. Or Draco shows up. He's home for his Easter holidays. I, it just always blows my mind that Rowling says Easter holidays and not spring break. Why Easter holidays? Resurrection. Again. Okay. And Draco looks at Harry, and he looks at him real closely, remember? Because Hermione put the hex on him so he doesn't look like he's got boils and, you know, swellings and stuff. And Draco's like, ah, I can't be sure. Notice, Lucius wants what? Come on, Draco. Tell us it's him. Because Lucius is thinking that we can have all our glory back. Draco's expression was full. I'm skipping several pages again. Uh, this is seventy-two and eighty-four is sixty-six, four sixty-six, four sixty-eight, somewhere like that. Harry saw Draco's face up close now, right beside his father's. They're extraordinarily like, except that while his father looked beside himself with excitement, Draco's expression was full of reluctance, even fear. I don't know. He turns and walks away. Are we ever told whether that's the truth or not? Does Draco recognize Harry? He just doesn't admit it. 
Or does he really not know? We're never told. Okay? So, Bellatrix is there, and they're going to torture Hermione. So Harry and Ron get taken down to the cellar. Um, Peter Pettigrew comes down. The last couple pages. This is like one, two, three, four, five or six pages before the end, probably. Pettigrew comes back down, grabs Harry. Harry could hardly breathe, and Harry says, you're going to kill me? Because Pettigrew's, you know, hands on his throat. After I saved your life, you owe me, Wormtail. And we're told, the silver fingers slacken. Harry hadn't expected it. <laughs> he saw the rat-like man's small, watery eyes widen with fear and surprise. He seemed just as shocked as Harry as what its hand had done. At the tiny, merciful impulse, it had betrayed. And he continued to struggle more powerfully, as though to undo that moment of weakness. Okay? Ron takes Wormtail's wand. And what happens? Wormtail's silver hand lets go of Harry and starts coming at him. Harry tries to hold it away. Pettigrew was reaping his reward for his hesitation, his moment of pity. He was being strangled before their eyes. Okay? So, Dobby helps them escape. He gets Loon out. He gets Grip Hook out. He gets Hermione Run out. Last one he takes is Harry. Last page of that chapter. They land at Shell Cottage, Bill and Fleur's place. And Harry yells, Dobby? The elf swayed slightly. Stars reflected in his wide, shining eyes. Together, he and Harry looked down at the silver hilt of a knife protruding from the elf's heaving chest. No help. He did not know or care whether they were wizards or muggles, friends or foes. All he cared about was that there was a dark stain spreading across Dobby's front and that he had stretched out his thin arms to Harry with a look of supplication. What does supplication mean? It's a um, Latin form for prayer. Like, help me, Harry Potter, you know. And Dobby dies. This is pretty major death, right? Probably more major than Mad-Eye Moody. The elf had gone where he could not call him back. Okay. Harry feels Voldemort. Voldemort's really, really angry. But Harry's third and fourth paragraph, first page of the wand maker, his rage was dreadful, and Harry's grief for Dobby seemed to diminish it. Why? Love overcomes hatred. And Harry says, I want to do it properly. It what? Burying Dobby, not by magic. Why is burying Dobby manually proper? I mean, Dobby is a magical being. It's not, he's not like someone who learned magic. He is a fully magical being. He didn't have to be taught magic. He was born with it. Okay, keep going. Why? I mean, I'm serious. I, I have no idea why, why she really does this. Do you think it was like to properly pay respects? To okay. Is this, you know, Harry bringing in the totality of his being, his muggle and his wizarding kind of existence joined together? I honestly don't know. It's, you know, I've been wondering since 2007 when this came out. And so he sets to work. Now, part of it, I think, is it's a plot device. 
Because it's while he's working, doing non-brain physical grunt work. I don't know if you've ever had to do that. You're in the military. You've had to, sure. You know, where you're just doing something that is rote. You don't have to think about it at all. And what does your mind do? Your mind starts to turn. The wheels start to turn. And you think about other things. When I really want to focus on something, I go do something physical. You know, used to be when my knees were good, I'd go for a 20-mile run. You know, and about eight miles in, I'd reach my groove, and the wheels would just be greased, and I'd be going 100 miles an hour up here. Okay? That's what happens to Harry. He dug with a kind of fury, relishing the manual work, glorying in the non-magic of it. For every drop of his sweat and every blister felt like a gift to the elf who had saved their lives. I think that's the closest we get. Dobby spent, spent, gave away. Like, you know, you spend money to get something in return. Dobby spent all of his magic so they could physically live. And so Harry, he's going to spend his physical energy as a mark of respect and honor to Dobby. His scar burns, notice, but he was master of the pain. The thing that Harry was told, book five, that he needed to learn, self-control, now he's got it. The thing that he was taught in book five, he needed to learn, occlumency, now he's got it. He can block out Voldemort. But not because of training. It's because of his love for Dobby. He felt it, that is, he felt the pain, yet was apart from it. He had learned control at last, learned to shut his mind to Voldemort, the very thing Dumbledore had wanted him to learn from Snape. Just as Voldemort had not been able to possess Harry while Harry was consumed with the grief for Sirius, so his thoughts could not penetrate Harry now, while he mourned for Dobby. Voldemort can't get close to that. Why? Go back to the prophecy. Harry has a power Voldemort knows nothing of, love. The ability to love. Where is love apparently, at least in these novels, shown the most? Through grief. Through loss. Grief, it seemed, drove Voldemort out. Though Dumbledore, of course, would have said that it was love. And then notice what happened. It's like the biggest, brightest light bulb in the world goes off in Harry's head. End of that paragraph. Understanding blossomed in the darkness. Hollows, horcruxes, hollows, horcruxes. He thinks of Wormtail. Dead. Why? Because of one unconscious impulse of mercy. Dumbledore had foreseen that. How much more had he known? And what happens. The image has been shattered. The image of Dumbledore, the idol of Dumbledore, is now gone. Instead, Harry starts rebuilding an image based upon what? Those prior experiences. Dumbledore would have known. Dumbledore would have understood. Dumbledore would have seen. Dumbledore would have explained based upon his previous experiences. Right. So, they say, you know, final words to Dobby and such. And then Harry marks on a stone. Here lies Dobby, a free elf. Was Dobby free before death? He wasn't enslaved anymore. So what does Harry mean, Dobby, a free elf? Is the free elf just referred to Dobby died a free elf? He acted of his own volition in saving Harry? Yeah, he did. So it could be that. Or it could be free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. You know, the old African-American spiritual. That is referring not to the freedom of slavery. It's referring to freedom of physical bondage. Resurrection. Is Dobby free? 
because he's freed from his material existence? I don't know. But his mind was now full of things that had come to him in the grave, ideas that had taken shape in the darkness, ideas fascinating and terrible. What are those ideas? Because we're going to skip a whole bunch beginning in a couple minutes. What did he see, or what does he see very shortly? He has a vision in just a minute, or in a page, whether it's a minute or not, I don't know. What does he see Voldemort do? He goes off to Hogwarts, breaks into the tomb. Right? But before then, let's back up for just a moment. Go to page 90. So 485? No. Plus 90 pages. 479 to 482, something like that. Harry says he needs to talk to Grip Hook and he needs to talk to Ollivander. And he thinks of the blue eye he had seen in the mirror. He looks out over the ocean, and he feels closer this dawn than ever before, closer to the heart of it all. The heart of what? The central enigma? Okay. But what's the enigma of? What, what's the it referred to? I, I don't know. He knew that Voldemort was getting there too. Getting there meaning getting to where Harry, take that back, I knew what it is. Getting back to where Harry has now mentally arrived. He knows what must be done. It's the hallows. The Horcruxes aren't, aren't important. And he knows where the hallows are. Or at least he knows where two of them are. Third one, he's not positive about yet, but he's pretty, pretty close. And he realizes Voldemort's like two steps behind me. But Voldemort can't get all three of them, right? Not until he gets one of them. The Dumbledore in Harry's head smiled, surveying Harry over the tips of his fingers, pressed together as if in prayer. Like, come on, Harry, come on, you can do it. And Harry has this conversation in his mind. You gave Ron the Bluminator. You understood him. You gave him a way back. You knew Ron would leave. You understood Wormtail, too. And if you knew him, what did you know about me, Dumbledore? Am I meant to know but not to seek? Did you know how hard I'd find that? Is that why you made it? this difficult. So I'd have time to work that out. But he is a seeker. What's he seeking? Knowledge. What knowledge? I think it's ultimately it's those two questions. Who am I and why am I? What is my purpose? Why am I here? Okay. And that's when he has, you know, in his mind, he sees the outline of Hogwarts. He talks to Griphook and Ollivander. What does he learn from each of them? What's he learn from Ollivander? About the Elder One. It is real. <laughs> Moreover, how does the Elder Wand get passed from one person to another one? Can you merely, here, have the Elder Wand? No. It has to be one. The person, the previous owner, has to be defeated. What does Voldemort think defeated means? Killed. Nope. It can be as simple as Spell your hearts. When did Voldemort lose the wand? 
previous book, Top of the Lightning Struck Tower, when Draco uses Expelliarmus. What did Harry just do when they left? Um, Malfoy Manor. He defeated Draco. Did he get the actual wand? Nope. Because the wand is where? It's with Dumbledore's body. But Dumbledore at that point was no longer master of the Elder Wand. Draco was. Harry has now defeated Draco. Harry is now master of the Elder Wand. Whether he physically has it or not. Okay? So what does he learn from Grip Book? Where did Grip Book work? Gringotts. Okay. So they got to go to Gringotts. Why? Because Tom Riddle had a vault there. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. End of that chapter, last page or two, Harry explains to Ron and Hermione, Ron, Dumbledore had the Elder Wand? Where, where is it now? Harry's kind of sitting there zen-like. It's almost like he's... Harry, it's at Hogwarts. Ron, let's go. we got to get it. Harry, too late. He knows where it is. He's there now. No, I can talk to you. I can, I can see Voldemort simultaneously. No. Ron, how long have you known this? Why have we been wasting time? Why did you talk to Gripper Curse? We could have gone. No, said Harry, and he sank to his knees in the grass. Why does Harry, he's talking to Ron, why does he sink to his knees? Physically, just physically, what is that symbolic of? Possibly, could be praying. When one is in an attitude of prayer, one is what before the thing one is praying to? Humble. When he drops to his knees, that's a mark or sign or symbolic of humility. Nope. I'm not going after what I want. He does want it. But he's, that gets put, pushed back. That becomes secondary. Okay? Dumbledore didn't want me to have it. He didn't want me to take it. He wanted me to get the Horcruxes. See, until he's burying Dobby, Harry's attitude has shifted to what? Deathly Hallows. Got to get the Deathly Hallows. Now he understands, I'm not meant to have the Deathly Hallows. Or at least I'm not meant to yet. Okay? So... Shell Cottage, second paragraph. The enormity of his decision not to trace Voldemort to the wand still scared Harry. He could not remember ever before choosing not to act, right? Book one, Harry acts. He saves the Philosopher's Stone. Book two, Harry acts. He defeats the Basilisk and Tom Riddle's ghost. Book three, Harry acts. He saves Sirius. Book four, Harry acts. He brings Cedric's body. He defeats Voldemort again. Book five, Harry acts to go save Sirius, you know. Book six, Harry's acting all throughout. Why is it important that he chooses not to act? This is an example, I think, partially at least, of what's called kenosis. Greek word, and it means self-emptying. Self-denying. Harry's doing what when he chooses not to act? He's denying himself. He's denying everything he knows to do. Right? Even in the first book, when they go to the zoo, and he talks to the snake, and then Vernon uh, Dudley comes up and punches Harry, 
he lets the snake go. Why? Because the snake's kind of got it harder than Harry even does. They go in the Forbidden Forest. He stops drink all the time, all the way along. Patronus Potter. He always acts to save others. Now, he has to not act. Right? This is symbolic, I think, of what's going to come at the end. Because what have, we, what have been, we been told the prophecy says? Neither can live while the other survives. That means you got to act. One of you's got to kill the other. And we could jump straight to the, you know, the duel. Voldemort, Avada Kedavra. Harry, nope. He doesn't not act entirely, but what does he do? He just kind of does a blocking spell. All right? So, we're told, a couple paragraphs on. The idea of Dumbledore's corpse, idea of Dumbledore's corpse frightened Harry. He felt he was still groping in the dark. He had chosen his path, but kept looking back, wondering if he had misread the signs, wondering if he shouldn't have taken the other way. Why? Isn't that like life? You make a decision, you decide, and then you start looking and you go, should I? <laughs> Was that the right decision? All right. Notice. Ron asked in response to about, you know, Dumbledore, is he dead three days after they had arrived at Shell Cottage? I don't think it's accidental that she makes that be three days because of all the symbolism with, you know, three days and all that. Okay, so we're going to skip a bunch. They go off to Gringotts. They get the cup. Chapter 27, final hiding place. Uh, da -da -da. We can skip that. Chapter 28, Missing Mirror. They make their way back to um, Hogsmeade. Who do they meet? Whose blue eye did Harry see? Aberforth Dumbledore. Okay. And we're told. I'm going to have to post a video for the rest of us in the church. But, uh, and, my reading of it, uh, 107 pages on, so 560, 561, 562, 63, something like that. Harry's talking with Aberforth. Paragraph that begins, Harry kept quiet. He did not want to express the doubts and uncertainties about Dumbledore that had riddled him for months now. He, he mentioned Elphias Doge. And Aberforth, that old Burke, jerk, moron, idiot, you know. He had made his choice while he dug Dobby's grave. He had decided to continue along the winding, dangerous path indicated to him by Albus Dumbledore. To accept that he had not been told everything that he wanted to know, but simply to trust. In other words, Harry has done what now? That he was refusing to do at the beginning of the book. Did they all think it was so easy? To do what? Choose what to believe. Harry's chosen what to believe. He's going to believe Dumbledore. Simply to trust, we're told. So, Aberforth tries to dissuade him. Page 567. Aberforth explains about what happened all those years ago back at the house with Ariana and Kendra and Gellert Grindelwald and his oh-so-smart brother. And here he explains, when Aberforth says something about, you know, Dumbledore, you know, was now free from having to, you know, take care of his family, free of his memories of home, Harry says he was never free. And he explains what Dumbledore was crying about when he drank the potion in the cave. He was reliving everything that happened to him. Right? Aberforth says, 
Dumbledore never loved anybody. Well, he loved himself. How can you be sure you aren't dispensable? This is 567, 568. Hermione, I don't believe it. Dumbledore loved Harry. He didn't. Why didn't he tell him to hide them? If he loved him, he would have protected him. Harry, because sometimes you've got to think about more than your own safety. Sometimes you've got to think about the greater good. And Harry, at 17 years old, comes to the conclusion that Dumbledore came to, but in a different fashion. And he comes to the conclusion that the character in one of my favorite fantasy series, The Chronicles of Prydain, Lloyd Alexander, that the character Taryn comes to. Taryn is a, a boy when the, when the five novels start out is a boy who really wants to be a hero, wants to be a warrior, wants to be a soldier, and all this kind of stuff. Right? And he has these notions of heroism. At the end of the fifth book, he defines what he now believes a hero to be. Someone who thinks more for others than for himself. Well, Harry's done that all along. But now, it's about the greater good. This is war. And what does war always involve? Always. One of my distant relatives said, war is hell. General Sherman. It's why he made it as hellish as possible on the South to try to end it quickly. Well, you're going to have casualties. You're going to have innocent casualties, and you're going to have, quote unquote, guilty casualties. Okay? So, lost item. They go off to school. Who shows up, by the way? Who turned quasi-bad in book five? Percy, welcomed back into the fold. We see Snape get sacked. We see Harry use the Crucio curse. On 591, 592. And because now he knows how to use it, that is, he knows you have to really want to inflict pain, he's able to. Why does he use it, and why is it forgivable in this context? Who's he used it on? Amicus Caro, one of the one of the Caro twins, who are now teachers at the school. Why does he do it? Because Amicus Caro spits in McGonagall's face. Harry pulls the cloak off. He shouldn't have done that. And we're told, "I see what Bellatrix meant." Harry said, the blood thundering through his brain. You need to really mean it. In other words. He deserved a lot of pain. McGonagall says, Potter, that was foolish. He spat at you. Potter, I, that was very gallant of you. But what's Harry doing there? He's coming to the defense of somebody who couldn't, at that moment, fight for herself. Okay? So we're going to go on. Skip a whole bunch. Battle of Hogwarts. I'm not going to talk about that page. End of the chapter. Elder Wand. Harry goes off. He observes Voldemort. We got five minutes. He observes Voldemort and Snape. And what does he watch? He watches Snape's murder. And Snape's last words to Harry. And notice what he's doing. Look at me. And he takes his memories and puts them in the flask. Why does he say, look at me? Keep going. What does Snape want his dying image to be? Lily 
Potter's eyes, which we don't know at that point. Okay? Harry goes up to Dumbledore's office, he gets the pensive, and he watches the memory. Okay? And what does he learn? Why was it wrong to call Snape coward? What had Snape spent the last 16 years of his life doing? I mean, literally. <laughs> Protecting Harry every step of the way. Why? Because he made one major screw-up in betraying Lily. And it's this chapter that tells us what was Snape's worst memory? We had a chapter titled Snape's Worst Memory, right? In book five. What was it? Is that the worst part of it though? It's when he calls me Lily of my brother. The woman he loved. Because it's in this memory we see what? We go back to the beginning of Order of the Phoenix. When Harry hears Aunt Petunia say, I heard that filthy boy talk about them. That wasn't James. That was Snape. And we hear, you know, all this stuff about Petunia wanting to go off to Hogwarts. And the reason she hated her sister so much was because she was jealous. Okay? So... Harry goes off to the Forbidden Forest. Why? Why does he willingly walk into the Forbidden Forest? What does he want to stop from happening anymore? Other people die. Other people die. Hedwig, Mad Eye, Fred, Tonks, Lupin. Notice the books begin with what? An orphan. The books end with what? An orphan. Who died in battle. Whose parents died in battle. Kind of like Harry's parents. Right? He goes off so that none others have to die. And I will put up a video that discusses all of this. And what does he think about as he makes his way to the forest? Let's see if I can find it real quickly. Before he meets up with his Parents and such. This is around 695. He was home, Harry's thinking. Yeah, well, I'm stopping. Hogwarts was the first and best home he had known. He and Voldemort and Snape the abandoned boys. Not quite true, though, right? Yes, Voldemort was abandoned. His mother abandoned him. There's no other way to put it. His father definitely did. Snape, we're not told that his mother abandoned him, but his father definitely did. Did Harry's parents abandon him? Not really. Did Sirius? Not really. Did Dumbledore? Not really. But what's the point? They all found home here. What is Harry doing when he's thinking that? He's identifying with Snape, and he's identifying with Voldemort. And last thing, that's why when we get to the end of the next chapter... King's Cross, or the chapter after that, that's why, what are Dumbledore's parting words to Harry? Do not, last page, do not pity the dead, Harry. Last page of the chapter King's Cross. Pity the living, and above all, those who live without love. 
That's who you should pity. What does he mean by pity? What has Harry decided to do by this point? He's going to go back. What is Dumbledore suggesting possibly? Why does he say don't pity the dead? What has Harry seen there in King's Cross? If that's what it is. <laughs> Remember there's that bench and there's the thing underneath it that looks kind of like what? A baby that's been flayed. Flayed is kind of your skin ripped off and it's kind of making this moaning sound. And Harry thinks, as soon as he realizes, he thinks, can I help it? And the double door appears and says, you can't help it. Don't pity the dead. This thing, it's dead for all intents and purposes. Why? What was that thing? I don't know, we're over time. That was the bit of Voldemort in Voldemort kills Harry, what does he do? He also kills the bit of himself, literally, that he put in Harry. Not six horcruxes, seven horcruxes, plus the bit of Voldemort still in Voldemort. In other words, if seven is the perfect number, then eight, it won't go up, eight is like the opposite, just like six is like the opposite. Any other number but seven, bad juju, you know? Okay, we'll stop there. Really wish we had one more day. But I will send, I'll post a video for, you know, you don't have to watch it, obviously.